Okay. Uh, this is an interview being held in the Delaware County District Library in Delaware, Ohio. Uh, this is in reference to the Little Brown Jug Oral History Project. Uh, my name is Richard Levy. We're interviewing Chip Thompson. Yep. Thompson is T-H-O-M-S-O-N, no P. Very good. And uh, the, uh, the date is January the 21st of 2020. And uh, so I will just start with uh, this question. Do you remember about how old you were when you first attended the Little Brown Jug Race? My first recollection, and people, I bet this answer doesn't surprise a lot of people. When you think about the Little Brown Jug, you can't help but think of a county fair. We're unique in that way. And so someone's first uh, recollection of a county fair is the smell when you walk in, uh, the popcorn, the animals. I mean, you can't walk by the pig barn and not smell them. So uh, as a very young child, I remember running around enjoying the fair. Um, always fascinated with horses. And that quickly turned into a passion when I saw what my grandfather Hank was able to do and what my father Tom Thompson was able to do as far as bring uh, what I would consider Delaware together in one location and be proud of what uh, we had and what we have and what we have to offer in the form of I would consider to be a, an incredible harness race that um, has no rival and um, those memories date back very a long way but I think my very first real memory would have been uh, uh, you know Falcon Sealster, I was probably a young teenager and that was an invitational race. Um, so uh, that was uh, a race that Roger Houston called. Okay. So you're going back to your teens. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so uh, as you said, I mean on the one hand there's the fair mm -hmm. and on the other hand there's the race. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I'm wondering about the race specifically whether you uh, were impressed with certain things or you have uh, early memories about uh, reacting to that, to that scene. So growing up, the race just didn't happen. We would, we would go into the kitchen and mom and dad would have on the table these blue index cards and these pink index cards and there's hundred of them and we knew you can't mess with the index cards as a kid. So we saw uh, the groupings and how payments were recorded because in order to participate in the Little Brown Jug you sustain your eligibility. You make a payment when you're a yearling, you make a payment when you're a two-year-old and so on. So back then all that was compiled by hand and it was index cards, there were no computers, it was a filing system. Uh, you had uh, constantly uh, seen my father, my mom, my grandfather working with compiling all that information which all brought to a culmination of that one great race <clears throat> on a Thursday in September. Yeah. So I saw early on that it just didn't happen. It took a lot of effort. Okay. okay. Um, have you attended the jug race for most of your adult life? Yes. I, my first jug would have been 1976. Uh -huh. So I graduated high school in 88. So, uh, you know, 10 years, or excuse me, I graduated high school in 84. That tells you how old I am. 84. So eight years before that, I would have been uh, maybe Ten. sixth grade. Yeah. Um, and, uh, quickly grew to appreciate what we had. I felt very fortunate. Um, and uh, I think that as you get older in life, you grow to appreciate things a little more. Yeah. And that's the case with me. Yeah, yeah. So you have seen lots of races, and I don't know whether or not um, you have some that you think were the most exciting or the most surprising or the, the most something. Mm -hmm. What Does anything come to mind after uh, whatever, <laughs> 30 years of watching oh, races. Wow. You know, Wiggle It Jiggle It was an amazing race for a horse that had probably uh, done something that a lot of, not a lot of horses have done, and that's a uh, race from an outside, uh, you know, 
race from the outside and still win. And not only did it race from the outside, it raced from the outside for half a mile, which meant it was going further and, and far, it was going farther than the horse that was inside. Mm -hmm. That was an amazing feat. I remember one of my favorite races was when um, it was raining. And the drivers would come into the winter circle and they're just caked with mud. Mm. And these driver, drivers are so happy. They're just, they, they could care less. They were just winning at Delaware. And so I was happy to be there with them. I was happy, you know what, I put on my muckaluck boots and uh, it, it, it was, uh, it was a, an, an environment in which it didn't matter what was going on, it was the fact that they were there. So I appreciate every moment of Delaware. And I hope that, and, and my goal, is that the fans also that way. I mean, it, it needs to be that way. That they have as much emotional investment. Uh, absolutely. In I mean, it, 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 for lack of a better term, I would say I want it to be Old Home Week. Okay. Can I ask you to what extent you think it is Old Home Week? Oh, so, well, that's a great question because to me it's tradition. Tradition as far as where I park, what I like to eat, who I get to see, um, uh, I, I don't like to see a ton of change, but yet change is necessary. Mm. The industry is constantly changing, and I recognize that. I've been involved in many aspects of harness racing, um, and I see where the sport's going. You've got racinos now, uh, so mm. money is starting to play a bigger role. Um, and. I want to see Delaware preserved in a, in a way that, um, you know, you still see that, that Ferris wheel okay. when you look across the way. Um, okay. So the, it's, it's a history that I want to try to preserve. Yeah. Are there some traditions that you think should just never be changed? Yeah, I've been a big supporter of heat racing, uh, but I'm probably going to lose that battle. Uh, owners. Um, the horses nowadays are meant to, to race one time. Uh, at least that's where the sport's going. Mm -hmm. To where when I was growing up in the, in the 70s, 80s, even in the 90s, heat racing was, you might have 30 horses, they're broken into three groups of 10, and you had to win twice. So that means you're gonna race two, possibly three times in one day. Um, I'm afraid that I'll probably lose that, but the excitement for the public for the betters, the fans, um, they like heat racing because it really shows the best of the best mm. on that any given day. But um, that, so that's a tradition that I'd love to keep, but I don't think I'll win that battle. So you see it as a, as a sort of tension between the owners, the ability of the horses to do this, and I'm, I'm wondering, well, what, what is the argument for eliminating heat races? Well, these are athletes, and these athletes are racing for a lot of money. Okay. We're talking tens of thousands of dollars. And the Little Brown Jug in the Delaware County Fair is part of the Grand Circuit. And the Grand Circuit's kind of like the PGA. The Grand Circuit goes from place to place to place. And feature races are always in the Grand Circuit. And so there's always money, and a lot of money. And so if my horse races really well and it wins, um, I want it to rest not get injured, and so some state that the possibility of injury could go up mm. through heat racing. Um, it, it's just, just these, these are such incredible animals, they're racing for so much money um, that I think owners realize that they don't want to risk That's the injury to the horse. And you know, these horses are treated so well. Um, that I, I don't blame the owner. They've got a lot in. Some of these horses are very expensive, so yeah. uh, I understand yeah. both sides. Okay, but if it were up to you, we'd well, if I, I, I try to find a, a you know what a middle ground. Unlike you know our government nowadays, there is there a middle ground, and and I don't know if there is, but I would welcome to try. Yeah, yeah. Um, o over your long experience with the race, I'm assuming that you have seen some changes. Mm -hmm. um, over those years. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what you think are changes for the better uh, and uh, maybe changes for the worse over that time? Oh, technology I think has made the sport better. Um, I think we have 
the ability now to televise the event. We have the ability to simulcast it throughout the United States. So for example, let's say you're in Idaho, you could maybe go to a racetrack there or Las Vegas and you could see the race on TV there. So it's broadcast, so we reach more people. Um, I think that's a positive. Um, I also think that it can be a negative because technology could also say, hey, I can watch it on TV, I don't have to come. Absolutely. Um, and we want you to come. We want you to experience the Little Brown Jug. You know, Sports Illustrated has the Little Brown Jug of one of the top 100 sporting events you need to see before you die. Because they say, you know, this little town in central Ohio comes together for this one race. And it's so much more than a race. Um, but it's something that we use to bring everybody together. Um, you don't necessarily have to be a huge race fan to enjoy the Little Brown Jug. So technology is a good thing. Um, a bad thing, I think, is technology. Is so, so, so is that a catch-22? Yeah, 22? yeah. yeah. Um, I also think that as we get older, we see people pass, and a lot of good friends. I've seen a lot of people pass away. Um, and then you got the younger group. Um, and the older I get, the more I appreciate the little things. And I think it takes age to get there. So um, I, I think that you know, the passing of time, we're going to see change. Mm -hmm. um, we have some that say, hey, let's race it at night and put lights up. Um, there are some that say, well, why don't you race on Saturday? You'd get more people here. And I'd say, well, uh, welcome to Central Ohio and Ohio State football. <laughs> you know, I mean, it rules the roost, and that's okay. I mean, uh, when we do it on Thursday, it's amazing how you might get a reporter from the Wall Street Journal there. So, because it's not a huge sports day. Fair enough. It fills a, a, a hole in the news. Right, the sporting right. News. Okay. Uh, perhaps you've, you've touched on this, but I want to ask it sort of specifically. Um, there are a lot of harness races. There are a lot of sporting events. Mm -hmm. In your view, what do you think makes the jug so special? Well, it's got to be tradition. Um, and and I, like I said, you know, it had always been tradition to do heat racing. Um, I think I might lose that battle, but I don't think that's going to diminish uh, the fact that horses are still going to want to come and race in the Little Brown Jug, and it's because we have a phenomenal facility. Uh, the race, the half mile racetrack is a huge investment by the fair board, and the fair board recognizes that and takes care of it. We have two people that work on it constantly. Um, we have people that, um, I guess you could say that history is on our side. Mom and dad always went, and I grew up going, and now I go and I take my children. So tradition, it can be due to repetition, or why do we do this? You know, still storage, why do we cut the ends off a of ham and we don't know, and then we ask grandma because she didn't have a pan big enough. <laughs> you know, well, I think that uh, Delaware County Fair and the Little Brown Jug are a tradition, and I think the big thing, I think Delaware, its hometown embraces it. I don't think, um, I don't think we've done a lot to uh, hurt that. I think we try to respect the tradition, if that makes sense. I hear you. So if, if the jug was no longer in Delaware, mm -hmm. Um, how would that affect you personally? How would you think it would affect uh, the community in general? Wow, if it wasn't in Delaware, I would hope I'd had a say on where it did go. Okay. Um, we don't know how close we actually came to losing the jug, I would say six years ago, five years ago, when uh, the fairgrounds was in such disrepair, not due to anybody's fault, but when we're having, uh, there's, you know, we're still a business, we still have to pay our bills, and when you look at a water bill of $16,000 a month due to cast iron water lines that are leaking, that's an unsustainable business plan. I don't care how much money you have, uh, you, can't, you can't, that's a, wa a raw resource that's, that's being washed away. I think that's irresponsible too. We needed to stop that. So, um, you know, and there's only so much money. Um, so. I feel as though if it were to leave, which I don't foresee it leaving, I'm on the Little Brown Jug Society, and the rules 
or the bylaws of the Little Brown Jug Society state that it will be raced in Delaware, Ohio. In order for those rules to be amended, you'd have to have a two-thirds vote by the Little Brown Jug Society. And uh, I don't see that happening. We have local directors, local people on that board. Um, the only other thing that could happen is if Delaware County Fair couldn't host it due to some catastrophic event. You know, if, if, the, if the fair went bankrupt or yeah. uh, didn't, didn't have the facilities it needed to put on the race. Does that make sense? Yeah. So those are the only two scenarios that I foresee and I hope that past efforts on my part have rectified that through the implementation of a hotel bed tax. And I want to get to that shortly. Yeah. Um, but I guess I wasn't aware that six years ago it was questionable. Well, it can, was. Can you say some more about I sure can. Happened? So the facilities at the Delaware County Fair are, were started in, let me back this up, 1938 there was a, a ballot movement that actually made the current fairgrounds possible. Mm -hmm. The voters approved and it was through the addition of a swimming pool at the fair office. Um, and uh, a WPA grant was issued and that was uh, part of the New Deal, okay. uh, FDR New Deal. So uh, the fairgrounds was built and some of those buildings are that old. So, and I will tell you, and I, 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 I gotta preface this, a lot of people might disagree with me, oh well the fair would never lose the jug. They might be right. But I see the fact that financially the fair could not sustain itself if it didn't change its ways. That's my personal opinion, mm -hmm. that we were losing money based on the fact that our facilities were antiquated. And if we didn't address that need, if we didn't address that concern, you know, if you're bankrupt, if you have no money, you, because you're wasting it on you know, sewer lines that are broken, water lines, leaky roofs, not able to fix some of these things, um, you know, you're in a pickle. So that's my personal opinion. And some, you know, maybe others would be right, Chip, you're ringing a bell that doesn't make any sound. I say, I hope they're right, but I saw what was before us. Okay. That was my thought. Well, you were very much involved in the bed tax, and I would hope that you would tell us the story. Um, I'm assuming that part of the impetus for that was seeing the facilities in disrepair mm. and uh, and needing some financial resources to be able to take care of them. Could you say a little bit about how this uh, got started and, and what the process was like? Sure. In the late 1990s, I don't, 96, 97, 98, I was a founding member of the Convention Visitor Bureau in Delaware. And the Convention Vision Bureau in Delaware is funded by a 3% hotel bed tax. So on that board, at the time, I think 3% uh, was generating a couple hundred thousand dollars. Um, they were not able to get Polaris money because Columbus had a Convention Vision Bureau that was already getting that money. So even thus though, lies... Even though it's Delaware County. Right. But thus lies the difference. You can't tax... Uh, a duplicate tax. Okay. So you have a hotel, motel, uh, visit, or, uh, a, a convention visitor bureau in Columbus getting that money. Delaware can't get it now because Columbus already gets it. Does that make sense? It does. So I actually tried in 2003. People don't know this, but I tried in 2003 working with Bill Harris, who was president of the Senate, John Peters, our county treasurer who recently passed away, yeah. um, and didn't, didn't get far. We had bed tech language done through legislative services. Um, and for whatever reason, it never really got off the board. I think because they want, I, I had some people say, you want to do what? Um, so uh, kind of gave up on the idea. I have the language in there. It's quite amazing, uh, the thought process. But um, it came back up, uh, what was it, four, four years ago. Five, well, six years ago, really, when I started pushing it again, seeing the grave need of the condition of the fairgrounds. Okay. Um, so that, that's how it came about. I actually, you know, through the Convention Vision Bureau, which I think is a great organization. Um, and uh, I also had to do one thing that I felt was very important. And there are only so many tax dollars to go around. 
And the Delaware County Agricultural, I think, again, this is my opinion, is not worthy of the public's tax dollars. I think that libraries, schools, uh, uh, developmental disability, uh, Council for Older Adults, other organizations are much more deserving, in my personal opinion. Okay. Um, and everybody's fighting over that dollar. So how do I solve a problem without affecting you, who may or may not come to the fair? Um, and this was a unique way to, to have a permissive tax mm -hmm. that not necessarily affects you, but accomplishes what it's set out to do. Okay. And so that, um, along with talking with a lot of people and doing a lot of legwork, um, got us to where we are today. So I'm curious how you undid Columbus's handle on all of those uh, hotels and motels. Well, that's a great question. So I said earlier that there was a, you can't duplicate tax. Uh -huh. Well, Columbus does not have an agricultural society tax. Okay. They have a convention and visitor bureau tax. So their money is allocated to the convention and visitor bureau. So when you pass a bed tax, it's allocated. It could be to a uh, sports authority, like up in Cleveland, to take care of the Brown Stadium, or it could be uh, uh, used and underwritten to offset uh, the budget of a, of a city. But um, so when we sat down with our legislatures and came up with this plan, um, there were many in the county that said, I will only support it if it's countywide. Um, and I'm like, okay. Uh, we didn't know legally how that would go about. Uh, it was beyond my pay grade. But um, Cliff Rosenberg, Speaker of the House, you had Keith Faber, President of the Senate, um, John Kasich, President, or was Governor at the time, uh, you had Jim Beakey and the House of Representatives, a lot of good people put together language that said, okay, Delaware, here's what you're going to do. We're going to put this language in the budget. It passed the budget. The Governor did not veto it. But it said you have to go and get the public to support it. So we were on the ballot. I don't know if you knew that. We were on the ballot and Delaware supported it 65-35. Uh, an overwhelming majority of the citizens of Delaware County, including those who lived in Polaris, voted yes to implement this hotel bed tax. It was a five-year pilot plan. That, uh, and that, that's key too. Pilot means, in legislative terms, new. They'd never heard of it before. So um, the governor said, you know, he basically, Chip, I, I support Delaware. He, you know, he lives in Delaware. Yeah. But let's let the citizens have a final say. That was hard, made me nervous. But um, I said, okay, don't let this challenge get in your way of what actually I felt was worth doing. Okay. What are your, what are your images of what will change at the fairgrounds and, and with the Little Brown Jug because of this influx of money? Oh, wow, it's gonna be amazing. Uh, I'm one person of a 21-person board. Uh, I can give you a primary example. Obviously, the water lines have been replaced. Mm. Now we have a $900 water bill. Already? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, we've roofs that were leaking are now repaired. Um, you've got horse barns that we're proposing be changed, switched out. Uh, you know, a lot of horsemen tr go to Florida right. because they don't want to be in an out outdoor stall. Well, we want to build uh, horse barns that uh, are covered and indoors. Uh, I'd love to see a nice riding, an indoor riding arena so that you and your family could, if you wanted to on a weekend, go watch jumpers and other horses. Um, I want to be able to per, put together a facility that meets ADA needs. Okay. That was very important to me that why can't, and at the time my grandmother, who was in a wheelchair, mm -hmm. be dropped off at the entrance of the fairgrounds, make her way through through the Arts and Crafts building, through the Coliseum, maybe a, a barn, and we can also take her through the wheelchair. She can go to the restroom and handicap restroom, watch a couple horse races, and then be wheeled back to her car. Why can't we have that? And I say we can. And, and she would not be able to do that? Well, our, our current facility right now, uh, it's probably not too wheelchair friendly because of the 
antiquated roads. Mm. Um, so we, we've quickly found out that uh, this bed tax, which generates a great deal of money, it will be $9 million for five years. Um, and you don't know this, but uh, I was able to get the legislator to extend it 15 more years. And so now, through uh, our current governor and current Speaker of the House, uh, they extended it 15 years, but they put in the codicil that it could be subject to referendum. And the Hotel Motel Association did not institute a referendum and force us to go on the ballot. So that uh, referendum expired in October, and the county commissioners are it before them uh, is to extend it another 15 years. So it's our hope our first building will be about $6 million. And it'll be a 4-H agricultural society building that will be the spotlight of the state of Ohio. And we're not just talking some little mamby-pamby building. We're talking a building that um, I feel Delaware will be so proud of. Uh, it's, we hope to be able to see 500 people for dinner. Um, that has nothing to do with harness racing. But what it does to do is creates a meeting place for Delaware. Um, and I think Delaware deserves it. And I think we deserve it in a pass-through permissive way that it isn't going to really cost you anything. And then, believe me, I follow a hotel motel bed tax. Columbus does not have an occupancy rate problem. Delaware does not have an occupancy rate problem. More and more people are coming. More and more people want to come to Delaware. And so if I build this facility, if we build this facility, more people will want to come to Delaware, and more people want to come to Delaware, and more people will stay in their hotels. That's my goal. That's my hope. Okay. I can't help but think about um, your grandfather. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it, you know, it, it, when I was thinking about this interview, um, other people that we've interviewed have talked about how the jug and the people who come to it, it's like a family. Mm -hmm. You know, in your case, it is a family. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm thinking about how far things have come from the time that Hank Thompson and Joe Neville talked about this to where it is now. Uh, could you say a little bit about how you see your grandfather, what kind of a person he was, how he, what, what was that like? He was very proud, very, you know, <laughs> when I sit back and think about Hank, uh, I didn't see him get mad a lot. Um, as a Thompson family, we take it personal. You know, you can be critical of the jug. A lot of people are. I mean, that's okay. Um, and so it's hard not to take it personal because when you've put so much of your life into something, I think you maybe have earned the right to say, have a say. Um, but um, ultimately, uh, Hank Thompson, his biggest le legacy, in my opinion, is that it's still going today. Yeah. You know, sure, uh, you know, the sulkies have changed. They're lighter. They're carbon fiber now instead of steel or whatever they were made of way ago. Um, but uh, it's this, it's this uh, sacred, valuable thing that I feel Delaware has said, well done, my good and trusted friend. Uh, let's, let's, uh, let's continue on and make it even better. And that is a, is a really good thing to be proud of. Um, I saw him work all the time. I saw him travel uh, as, a, as a steward of harness racing. Uh, you know, I'm on the little, I'm a Grand Circuit steward and I go to these events and represent Delaware. And I see the excitement people have for what Delaware's doing. They look to Delaware, you know. Um, I go to county fairs, uh, Richwood or Marion, and I see what they're doing um, and appreciate the fact that they're doing everything they possibly can to put on great harness racing. So uh, as far as Hank Thompson, uh, I saw in him a passion, kind of like a second job. Mm. Um, you know, uh, you look at, here's a, there was an article in today's paper, Jack Nicklaus just turned 80. Well, obviously he was a golfer, but is Murfield his passion? You know, people come to the Memorial Tournament. 
Um, he created this, uh, and it would be my hope, and I'm sure Jack Nicholas would be, listen, this event is bigger than just one person. Yeah. It will change. At the end of the day, you and I can sit down in 25 years at the 100th and say, still here. Right. Right. So your grandfather's legacy, I mean, clearly there's the paper, mm -hmm. but there's the jug. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. The, the torch kind of got passed to your dad. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what was that like? <laughs> wow. So I can give you what I th remember of it. My grandfather, uh, Tootie, got sick. And so Hank, she had had one of the, actually one of the first uh, open heart surgery bypasses in the state of Ohio a long time ago. I wow. didn't know what it was. She was at Cleveland Clinic. Um, and that's when Hank said, uh, Tom, you've been helping. Uh, now is the perfect time for you to assemble your own friends, your own crew, and put on this race. And so dad, uh, and he would have rightfully said and has always said, you accomplish great things with great people. And so he surrounded himself with really, really good people that he could trust. And by doing that, uh, he or Delaware, or I don't think he himself would say, we have experienced uh, tremendous success. Um, and it's through, you know, surrounding yourself with smart people. You, I mean, you have people like Steve Wilson, who was Hank's friend, maybe a little younger, Tom Thompson's friend, uh, the Hoffman family at Buns, uh, Rex Welker and, and the Welker family. You've got good Delaware people seeing the fact that, you know what, we need to continue this because this is a good thing. Mm. So uh, I guess when you choose your friends uh, and they're there to help you, uh, they get a lot of the credit too. Okay. Do you feel like the torch has been passed to you? Oh, wow. Um, maybe some. I, like my brother T, he works, he works at the fairgrounds as, as a marketing director and works every day. My brother-in-law, Tom Wright, who uh, is director of racing, Tom probably can't go a day without being on the phone with somebody or talking to somebody or going to a meeting. Uh, and me, I, I am, like right now, I'm in charge of the advertising committee for the 75th Little Brown Jug. Uh, I've taken on uh, many roles that might not be harness racing related, such as seeing the need for this hotel bed tax. Uh, I hope that that bed tax has an everlasting impact on the fair, because with a good fair, we have a good race. You know, I'd love to see the fair, uh, you know, profitable 51 weeks out of the year, and that's if the jug, if it rained every day, we just keep going right along. Maybe so, that's your legacy? Well, my legacy, I hope, is that we have left something better than what I found it. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I, I very much appreciate you, you know, coming in and participating. I, what I wonder is if there are some topics or some stories about the jug or things around it that you think we need to hear about in order to get a, a really full picture of this. Is there anything that's been left out? I'm, I'm extremely happy with the support that Delaware has gotten on a local basis through the county, through the city, and then the state level. It's amazing. Uh, people don't see that, but I feel blessed. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we've done a good sales pitch. Okay. Maybe. Maybe Delaware has. I think. Um, You've got a city council and a county commissioners that work together to help the fair. Um, we're never going to be perfect, but I, I will tell you that with the help of a lot of good people, um, I want to continue to see this grow. Um, I'll be very vocal on what I think. Mm -hmm. And I'll be very honest that I'm not always right. Um, but what I will tell you is, is that if you're not out there working to better something, um, we're just, it's just going to get worse. Sure. And so as a community as a whole, mm. I'm very excited and very proud to say I live in Delaware. Um, so everybody has their role to play. Yeah. 
city's doing a city work, county's doing its county work, uh, the state's doing the state's work, and I look at my little world and say, I'm willing to do some of the Delaware County Fair work. Um, we have a 21 person board that does everything from, like yesterday it was interesting, I had a call from a horseman that said, hey, there's not enough salt on the roads up at the fairgrounds. So I said, okay, no problem. I called Dave and he said, I'll take care of it. Um, it's that kind of cooperation where that had nothing to do with the little brown jug, but it had everything to do with the fairgrounds itself. And, um, you know, no one entity, I would say the fair board, is perfect. We're going to make mistakes. Um, did we learn from them? And if we did, then we're going to be better off. Um, I sincerely hope that people respect what we're doing with this bed tax. The, you know, the fair board is extremely conservative with it. Um, and we spent hours and hours and hours uh, planning, working with some really smart people. And um, the fruit of those uh, hours and, and, and all of that we've put together hopefully will come to fruition. Not as fast as I'd like. We're in a economic boon construction wise. Yeah. Delaware's seen, you know, hard to get good contractors. So we, uh, as a fair board, agreed we wouldn't go into debt right mm -hmm. now. So we've saved that bed tax money to build this first building. Um, work with the county extremely well work with the city. People don't realize this, that the fair in 1938 is really interesting. The zoning was done by probably a handshake. You're going to bring a fair. Well, quickly we found out that the fairgrounds is zoned at residential. <laughs> so, you know, we had an alleyway going through it. So we have to abate the alleyway. We have to re get zoning redone and all these things that people don't see behind the scenes that have had to take place. But, um, uh, it just is a process that we're going through, um, and I want everybody in Delaware to be proud, including the hotels, that you know what, A, we appreciate the fact that we're getting this money. Sure. Um, and we appreciate the efforts that everybody's put into it. Um, has everybody been happy? Is everything perfect? No. But at the end of the day, can we all agree to disagree and meet back here again to keep working? And absolutely, I think that's been the most incredible thing, um, that we work through issues and we uh, attack them with vigor. Um, and we, me, um, see a bright future for Delaware. And economic impact-wise, uh, boy, I want to have a tremendous economic impact on Delaware with this whatever we build and when we build it. It's the stars for Delaware. I honestly think that we've, we've talked with you know, people like the Quarter Horse Congress. Can you bring us some horse shows? Uh, we, anything and everything we can think of. We've been to other fairgrounds, steal shamelessly from, from ideas and good things that they've done. And they've encouraged us. Uh, but um, we see a bright future. And we see that we've been very blessed. And it's my hope that Delaware, you know, in the next 10 years, we can sit back. And in 25 years, you know, we'll be at 100. Um, boy, that'd be something. So, yeah. Yeah. with God willing. Uh, about the 75th, mm -hmm. um, are there, to your knowledge, plans uh, for a celebration? Uh, uh, frankly, do you see a way that what is coming out of this oral history could be useful, could be a part of a 75th anniversary celebration? I'll tell you what, the first thing when, when you had talked to me, I wish that there were oral histories done a long time ago. Oh yeah. Uh, so if anything, people can sit back and learn from what we've done right and what we've done wrong. Um, as far as planning and success of the 75th, uh, I, I, to be honest, I know that somebody from a major, uh, I'm talking extremely large country group that said we'd like to come and on Friday and occupy the infield um, and have a concert the week of the 75th Little Brown Jug. Um, then they quickly said they need a half a million dollars to do it. But we had one board member that said, I'll work on doing that. I'm like, wow, Godspeed, John Glenn, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, but so 
I anticipate the 75th Little Brown Jug to be something where we have more people than have ever been at a harness race in history. Mm -hmm. That's a goal of mine. I would anticipate that if you're not there, you'll wish you were. Um, so we need good weather and uh, create an environment where there's something for everybody. And that would mean the little kid who's the first experience might be the pig barn because of the smell to the 70 year old man that says, I sit here in I've this chair. Sat here. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I sit in this chair around this fence and that's where I'm planned to be. It. And it's my hope that says your chair will be waiting. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Well, you're welcome. I really appreciate your, your time. Yes. And, and your ideas. So. Uh.